J. Germain Bay with Elodium Morris Cranium, Ante Colorado. The acronym is AMPAC. I am the Chief Judge of Consular Court. Uh, today is class number 60. Class 60. What did we learn in class 59? Well, we were finishing up, right, with articles 31 through 45 of the Act of Service of 1906, Chapter 3. And what did we learn in class 59? We're learning more about how the Moors are able to hold on to the jurisdiction over any banking in the empire, right? So therefore, we oversee all the banking financial institutions. That means we oversee all the gold as well, right? We're, on, we're overseeing all the monetary funds in our empire. The treaties give us the sovereign jurisdiction over all monies in the empire. That's what Moors have to understand, right? Because you cannot have a state that's independent without the means and the ability to get into what's called trade and commerce with other states. So now that Moors are what you call varying stages of advancement, one of the obligations we have as now modern organic states is to get into our financial banking. That's a part of the triple principle, right? So your triple principle is sovereignty and independence, interior domains, and economic liberty without any inequality. And how do we maintain our equality of banking? First thing we have to do is we have to get our gold returned before we can mint gold, right? We have to get our precious metals returned back to us in the form of gold and silver, right? It doesn't matter if the United States of America has put their mint on it. As soon as we get it back, what happens? We melt it down and we turn around and put our mint on it, right? And who does that? The entire state does that. Once we're now coming to a point when we start to conclude, once we conclude the Constitution of the United States of Morocco, then the United States of Morocco in its Constitution through the trustees that oversee the National Trust, the National Treasury, as well as our state banks can now get together and formulate what our currency is going to look like, etc. Right? So, hold on. So therefore, when we're talking about our Empire State Bank, right? Empire State Bank of what? Of Morocco. That Empire State Bank oversees the vast empire and all banking institutions in the empire are subordinate to our state bank. What type of state bank? The Empire State Bank. Obviously, each one of our more states will have its own independent bank within its state. But that independent state will also have the Empire State Bank that oversees each individual bank that's within, within our several territories of the more state governments, right? So at the end of the day, chapter three is about controlling your economics, right? Economic liberty without any inequality. What does that really mean? That the colonists cannot do anything to try to prohibit, to try to interfere, to try to create an impediment for more to get their gold back and for more from there to establish their banking institutions along with their own notes, their own currency. That way we can get into trade and commerce with the other states around planet Earth. That must be understood, right? What else did we learn from Class 59? We started learning about this word called Furman, F-I-R-M-A-N, right? Furman, that was Article 45, right? And the Furman talks about that being a charter, that being a permit, that being a grant, that being a colony in the empire of Morocco. We'll talk about that a little bit more today. We talked about that in Class 59. We'll do a quick recap of that today because it's very important for Morris to understand what a ferment is. What else is a ferment? A ferment is a constitution. Keep in mind that Sidi Mohammed extended the colonists and gave them an opportunity to establish their constitution in Morocco. That constitution, commonly known as the United States of America, right, the contracting state, that was an extended grant. The city, city Mohammed granted the 13 colonies would allow them to establish a constitution. But that constitution came from what? It came from the sovereign. The sovereign was the empire of Morocco. City Mohammed was the administrator over the empire at the time. So the sovereign the administrator, Sidi Mohammed, allowed the United States of America to establish a constitution, but that constitution is a ferment, and that ferment is a charter. That must always be understood, all right? We'll talk about that a little bit more today, all right? So let's go ahead and get into class, class 60, all right? As everyone knows, we always open up about the constitution. 
Each more state will have to have their own independent constitution that needs to be ratified, be and promulgated, right? With the United Nations Charter, Article 102 with the Secretary and the Secretary General, right? So everything is about constitutions because you cannot enforce treaties, declarations, conventions, or resolutions without having a constitution that outlines your territory, your permanent territory, right? And also you have your free grants of the government. After that, you will see to the treaties, and then after that, you can start to enforce your treaties. All right? Okay, let's go ahead and get into the class. All right. So, obviously, in class 59, we read up to Article 45, but as an overlap, we'll go ahead and read Article, Article 45 one more time, and then we get into Article 46, right? We'll try to finish up uh, Chapter 3 today, which is Articles 46 uh, through 58, and all the Articles 31 through 58, but we'll try to finish up 46 through 58 today. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in and get started. So as we already know in class 59, we read over Article 45. But Article 45 is a very important article. Why is that? It sets up the jurisdiction. What type of jurisdiction? Not only the state jurisdiction, but it sets up the civil and criminal jurisdiction over any banking in the empire. What type of empire? The Moorish Empire, right? So who oversees the banking in the empire of Morocco? That would end up being our Empire State Bank. That's who oversees the bank. But who helps to support the Empire State with any type of dispute? That is the Consul Court of Morocco, right? So Article 45 starts to get into this. Now keep in mind, in Article 45, you go back to France versus the United States of America, 1952, right? Page 197, right? Page 197. Keep in mind that ICJ pointing out two Moors. The Article 45 was one of the articles that the ICJ pointed out that said you Moors need to enforce your treaty provisions of Article 45, right? And Article 45 is a standalone article oversees all banking in Morocco. That's very important to understand, right? That means that the consular court can issue its orders, judgments, and opinions from the consular court as it relates to banking, right? Your consular court can immediately issue an order for the United States of America or any trustees to immediately return our gold bullions. Immediately. And that order is final. The only way the United States of America can now come in and try to appeal that or try to reject to it, A, they have to now try to appeal that to the Consul Court or the Minister of Foreign Affairs or the Consul General. If they still don't like that appeal, guess what the only option they have left? To take it to the International Court of Justice because they feel as though it is unfair to them that they have to return the gold back to the Moors according to the treaty provisions. Obviously, we already know that that's a losing position for them because the treaty is supreme law of the land, not their constitution of the United States, and it's certainly not the constitution of their international organization, better known as the United States, which is a corporation, right? So under Article 45, the ICJ points this out. It's very important to understand. What are they pointing out? They're pointing out about the Act of Algeciras, talking about the consular jurisdiction, and they point out Article 45. Okay, let's go back to it. Here's the World Court pointing that out. Okay, Article 45. Actions instituted in Morocco by the bank shall be brought before the consular court of the defendants or before the jurisdiction of Morocco. Let's pause right there. Who's the defendant? If we're now the sovereign state, right, the more sovereign states, that means immediately... The United States of America becomes a defendant, right? Because they're the contracting state, right? They become now the respondent, and we are the claimant. We're making a claim against them. We're the plaintiff. Plaintiff means we're making a complaint. We're the complainant. And they're the respondent, i.e. the defendant, because they're trying to defend their position, right? We bring them into consul court. Based upon what? Whatever they're doing to violate our economic liberty without any inequality, and specifically talking about the financial institution of our empire bank and dealing with them, okay? So, as you can already see, the treaty specifically talks about the jurisdiction. Article 45, actions instituted in Morocco. That's the key. Actions instituted in Morocco, not the United States of America. Actions instituted in Morocco, not the United States. It's all about jurisdiction, about your language, Morris. You must change your vernacular. You're not in the United States, and you're not in the United States of America. 
You're where? In Morocco. And where's the United States of America? In Morocco. Where's the United States International Organization? In Morocco. Okay, Article 45. Actions instituted in Morocco by the bank shall be brought before the consular court of the defendant or before the jurisdiction of Morocco. So it's all about the jurisdiction of Morocco. Everything's about jurisdiction. So when you use the word jurisdiction, that's a very powerful word. What does jurisdiction really mean? It's talking about who has civil and criminal jurisdiction. And when you have the civil and cr criminal jurisdiction, that's called integrity of domains. And whoever can maintain the integrity of domains controls the wealth. She who controls the land controls its laws and its wealth. That's the triple principle, right? So up here, this is all about jurisdiction. This is why the ICJ is pointing this out as it relates to the monetary fund, as it relates to gold, as it relates to banking. What type of bank? State banks. State banks. Okay? Let's continue from the top. Article 45. Actions instituted in Morocco by the bank shall be brought before the consular court of the defendant or before the jurisdiction of Morocco in accordance with the rules of competence established by the Sharifian treaties and firms. This is a very important word to understand right here. Why is this in the treaty? Because they already underscored the treaty. But why are they adding this word firm? The constitutions. Because it's about constitutions. So you're enforcing treaties, constitutions. And who has a constitution called the United States of America? Well, the colonists do. Because they're tenants in Morocco. And according to their constitution, Article 6, Clause 2, in which they refer to as the Supremacy Clause, treaty is the supreme law of the land. So right here, the firmament is being pointed out. Treaties and constitutions. Treaties and charters. Treaties and permits. Treaties and licenses. Treaties and colonies. Firmament is a multi-use word, right? It's a generic word. Let's go to it. Firmament, as a recap. Mother? One, a sovereign's edict. Synonyms, decree, order, command, commandment, proclamation, mandate. Two, a grant or permit. Synonyms, authorization, license, pass, voucher, ticket, warrant, Document, certification, passport, visa. Okay, so that's a firmament, right? The firmament is issued by the sovereign's edict, right? And we learned about the edict. The edict is what? Mother, please. An, an official order or proclamation issued by a person in authority. Quote, unquote, Clovis issued an edict protecting church property. Synonyms, decree, firmament, order, command. Commandment, mandate, proclamation, pronouncement, dictum, dictate, fiat, bill, promulgation, law, statute, act, enactment, ordinance, regulation, rule, ruling, injunction, manifesto. Okay, so the edict is issued by the, uh, it's an official order or proclamation issued by a person in authority. So Sidi Mohammed gave what? A Proclamation. What's the proclamation? That's the promulgation. Promulgation means what? Notification, a public notification. So when the colonists turn around and tell you Morocco was the first country to recognize the United States of America, what to recognize mean? That Sidi Mohammed is the sovereign performed a proclamation. He performed a promulgation out loud to the world that he recognized the 13 colonies, because he, the sovereign, Sidi Mohammed, who was an administrator over the Moorish Empire, allowed the 13 <clears throat> colonies to remain in Morocco with what? A grant, permission, a license, a charter, a constitution, i.e. a corporation that was set up in Morocco, right? Okay. How do we know that it is a what? A decree, right? It's a decree. It's a firmament, so we, we look it up the word firmament, right? The firmament was an order from Sidi Muhammad that allowed them to set it up, right? 
But what we really learn about the ferment, let's go back. The ferment is a grit or permit. And all grits and permits have what? Expiration date. All grits and permits, licenses, have an expiration date. Why? Because you need to take a look and see if that's something you want to actually renew on both sides of the parties, right? Okay, so let's, let's, let's go now take a look at this charter, this firm in the United States of America had, okay? We take a moment to take a look at this. It's very important. Okay. Here's a provision from the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, 1787, Article 25, okay? Now, Article 25, mother. Article 25, this treaty shall continue in full force with the help of God for 50 years. We have delivered this book into the hands of the before mentioned Thomas Barclay on the first day of the blessed month of Ramadan in the year 1200. Okay, so in 1787, the Constitution, oh, okay, in 1787, Sidi Muhammad allowed the United States of America to sign on to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. And he gave them a 50-year lease agreement. He gave them a 50-year permit. He gave them a 50-year charter. He gave them a 50-year corporation status to remain in Morocco for 50 years. Right? Then in 1836, it was time to do what? Renew it. Or terminate. Okay. All right. Mother? Treaty of Peace and Friendship, 1836, Article 25. This treaty shall continue in force with the help of God for 50 years after the expiration of which term? Pause. Everything you said, see in red text, I added for study purposes, right? This is the impact study session because what we got to understand, we have to break this down into two parts. This was all one paragraph. I broke it down to two parts because you have to read it in two parts, okay? There's, there's two parts here in this provision. All right, so let's start from the beginning. This treaty shall continue in force with the help of God for 50 years after the expiration of which term expiring September 15, 1886. The treaty shall continue to be binding on both parties until the one shall give 12 months notice to the other of an intention to abandon it, in which case its operations shall cease at the end of 12 months. Okay, are you catching what's happening? There's two parts to this contract. In 1836, Article 25, which was the only provision that they changed between 1787 and 1836, the only provision that was changed was Article 25. The United States of America want an opportunity to be able to cancel the contract whenever they got ready. The soldier said, okay, I have no problem with that. Let's write up the provision that gives you an opportunity to cancel it as well. Okay? But well, watch what happened. The treaty shall continue in force with the help of God for 50 years. So that's the permit. That's the permit. After the expiration of which term? What term? The 50 years is the term of the permit, the charter, the constitution. It expires when? September 15, 1886. Where did I get that date from? Okay, let's go to the original treaty, 1836. Peace and friendship. Treaty sealed by the Emperor of Morocco at Meganese, September 16, 1836. So therefore, if you're looking at 50 years, right? 50 years will stop at September 15th, 1886. Okay, let's go back to it. So it expired 50 years later, September 15th, 1886. So the treaty expired, but in the provision, what did they do? They said, however, the treaty shall continue to be binding on both parties until the one shall give 12 months notice to the other. Who's the other party? So who's the party? It's the states, right? To the other of an intention to abandon it, in which case its operation shall cease at the end of 12 months. So what's happening? 
The treaty expired on 1886, and it went automatically, basically into an annual contract. It's an annual renewing permit. It's an annual renewing charter, right? So watch this. The treaty shall continue to be binding on both parties, even though the term has expired of the 50-year requirement, right? So now it's now down to a 12-month notice. It's 12 months. I'll break it down. The treaty shall continue to be binding on both parties until one shall give 12 months notice to the other of an intention to abandon it, in which case its operation shall cease at the end of 12 months. So what's happening? This is what you call a type of contract that doesn't have an expiration date. But it immediately expires if one of the parties petitions to abandon it. Meaning it no longer has a fixed 50-year obligation. It basically ex expires as soon as one of the parties extends a notice to abandon it. Which means every year, because we're talking 12 months, Every year, it basically just renews every year that no one petitions to abandon it. So it's been renewing ever since 1886 until it's just perpetual, right? It becomes perpetual until someone now petitions to abandon it. Why is this important to understand? Because most people think it's a 50-year contract. Now, the 50-year provision Obligation ended in September 15, 1886. The second paragraph talks about now it immediately went into a status where it became perpetual until one of the parties abandoned to it, abandoned, uh, petitioned to abandon it, right? Well, Are we petitioning them to abandon it? So at any time, a Moorish state empire can acknowledge that they need to remove an abandoned state because now it's open. So at any time that we let them know that we have formed our state within 12 months, then they should abandon the throne, correct? No. So it all comes down to what? Article 24 of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, right? Article 24 talks about what? You must now, anytime there's a dispute, the two disputing states must submit a friendly application that sets up the arrangements, i.e. the mechanisms. And therefore, someone has to reject to that application. So we would have to fill out an application in order to submit to them that we want to now petition to abandon the treaty. They have certain mechanisms in place where they can reject that in order to now get into what's called mediation. But we don't want to abandon the treaty, do we? No, we don't. But I'm just reading the treaty provisions as is, right? Why is this important to understand? What's the mindset here? You must understand the United States of America, let's, let's think about this for a second. Since they've always known about this provision, why didn't, they, why didn't they petition to abandon it and say, we ain't worried about more, so we're just going to stay here permanently? Because they had to get out of it. Right. Right? So if the, if the United States of America would have petitioned to abandon the treaty, <laughs> they would have lost their own permit. Mm -hmm. They would have lost their own license to remain legally. It's just like if you're leasing an apartment. If you don't go down there and renew it, the landlord, the property manager, got every right to do what? Put you out. Put you evict you, right? Because now you're doing what? You're, you're holding on to possession of a property illegally. Trespass. It's trespass. That's correct. So you must understand the reason why they never petitioned to abandon it is because A, they know they will have to now do what? Vacate. But if they're now holding on to the property, if they think they're holding on to a use of force, right? Why well, don't they still just abandon and say, I dare you to try to make me leave? You know why they don't do that? Because that means they would no longer be a state. Because what gives them the authority to be a state? Their constitution, the United States of America, and them signing off on the treaty as being a state. And if they don't have a state anymore because of that permit expire, that means they don't have no more state rights. They just become what? An illegal alien in Morocco that has no rights as a people because the Constitution extends sovereignty to you that sets up your jurisdiction. They don't have no jurisdiction to claim if they allow the treaty to expire on them. Could I ask 
question? Clear, but so which constitution is in uh, subordinate position? All of their constitutions are subordinate because all their constitutions are foreign firms, right? Okay. Let's take a look at that, brother. Let's, let's answer it with a reference point. Okay. We looked up the definition of charter. Charter. Now, an instrument emanating from the sovereign power in the nature of a grant, either to the whole nation or to a class or portion of the people, to a colony or dependency, and assuring to them certain rights and liberties. So see, Muhammad allows them to do what? To declare their independence. The 13 colonies declare their independence. How could they do that? Because see, Muhammad allowed them to remain in the land, but he also recognized they needed a constitution because that constitution was a charter. This is the history you must understand. Before they were the United States of America, right? They have the Articles of Confederation, right? Even before the Article of Confederation, they were nothing but charters and extension of Great Britain that were in Morocco. Great Brit Britain extended them charter privileges to extend their parliamentary procedures and courts and laws over into Morocco. They turned around in 1774 and said, we're going to get away from those charters, right? Massachusetts was the first colony to say, we're cutting off the charter extension they have with Great Britain. And after that, the other 12 colonies said, yeah, we're going to get rid of the charters as well. After that, they established their own charter called the Articles of Confederation. That was a charter. Then they dissolved that and established the United States of America, which was a charter. But each and every time, they had to deposit that charter with the sultan, which was the sovereign. So they had to always send to the sovereign their colony and dependency constitution, i.e. their charter, with the hope that the Sovereign would allow that emanating instrument to have an expiration date, a start and end date to remain in Morocco. Always remember that the colonists are immigrants with an E in our land. They were seeking asylum and refuge in Morocco because they were always in battles with their original homelands, right? So when you go to charter, I know this is redundant, but, but redundancy is good, okay? According to the charter, the United States of America themselves admit that they are a charter, okay? It says, as such also were the charters granted to the certain of the English colonies in America. Charters were extended to them. They wrote this, right? Their barristers, lawyers, and attorneys wrote this, right? Black law dictionary. But it goes down to say, a charter differs from a constitution. Why? Because the Constitution has to come first before a charter. A Constitution can set up a charter. Right? So, you, you, you click on down. Let's go on down. Let's get down to the good stuff. So it says, also a corporation's constitution or organic law. So, a charter can, is also a corporation. That's claiming to have a constitution because constitutions mean that it's just a, it, it constitutes mm -hmm. the bylaws. No different than any company, right? Every company has what their articles, incorporation, etc. They're just bylaws. They refer to a constitution because a constitution constitutes the bylaws. For everybody to function as chairmen of the board to govern over that corporation, govern over that charter. All banks have chairmen. All banks are charters. That's why we're going over this, because all of their banks are nothing but charters. They have been extended a ferment. And who extended the ferment to their banks? Well, first, it was the United States International Organization that extended to all their privatized banks. But the United States International Organization was given permission as a charter by the United States of America, who set up the United States. And the United States of America was given, what? A sovereign status to remain in Morocco with their permit that, ex that expired every 50 years, and then that language was changed in 1836 to say now it's not a 50 year thing anymore, it's 12 months. Why is this important to understand? This is why the United States of America did not want Moors to know they were Moors. The Treaty of the Act of Algeciras. Not only lets Morris oversee all of the empire banks, 
It also said our courts oversee any disputes dealing with banking. Do you know how powerful that is when you control the civil and criminal jurisdiction of the land and all the banking? Most people have a desire to be powerful. And what makes you powerful? They save money, and that's not the truth. You know what makes you powerful? Laws. She who controls the land controls the laws, and then it's wealth. Moors control the land, the laws, and the wealth. That's what makes act, the act of Sarah so powerful. That Article 1 talked about controlling the militia, the police, and the military. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, chapter 1. Chapter 2 talked about what? Controlling all arms with what? Ferments called licenses and permits. And you get to chapter 3, now we oversee all banking, which means we oversee all gold, silver, and notes in the empire. That must be understood. That's your triple principle. Sovereignty and independence, integrity of domains, economic liberty without any inequality. Now, I told the Moors it's one of the most powerful treaties ever written in history. There is no other treaty written where the sovereign people have control over a vast estate such as an empire. This is an empire treaty. This isn't a, just a simple standalone state treaty. It's not a kingdom treaty. It's an empire treaty. That must be understood. It's the Moorish Empire. It's the Moroccan Empire. This is what you have to understand. And our banks oversee all banking in our <laughs> jurisdiction. And not only does our bank oversee all jurisdiction, so does our courts. Let's take it from the top. Article 45, actions instituted in Morocco by the bank shall be brought before the council court of the defendant or before the jurisdiction of Morocco in accordance with the rules of competence established by the Sharif and treaties and firmness. Actions instituted in Morocco against the bank shall be brought before a special tribunal consisting of three council magistrates and two associates. The diplomatic body shall each year arrange a list of magistrates, associates, and substitutes. The tribunal shall apply to such cases the rules of law, procedure, and competence established by the French legislation and commercial matters. Appeals from judgments pronounced by this tribunal shall be taken to the federal court of Lausanne, whose decision shall be final. Now wait a minute. Like I said in class 59, why is France's name continually mentioned in this treaty? It's because France loaned the Sultan some money. France wanted to make sure it was in the treaty that the Sultan had to pay back that money. Mm -hmm. And it had to be paid back to Britain and Spain, etc., and all the other colonists that chipped in to establish this banking institution in which the bank they established ended up being a corporation first. At first, it was a corporation that they allowed the Moorish government and the Sultan to oversee it but the shareholders were still holding on to it as collateral. And the shareholders was making money off of this as well, right? So they injected their original capital to get established. The Sultan's borrowing money, and now they're getting their return on investment, and they're holding on to these banks as collateral, okay? So, <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit more about this, um, this appeal judge pronounced right here. Appeals from judgments pronounced by this tribunal shall be taken to the federal court of the sod whose decisions shall be final. What does that mean? So the company comes to court, the Moorish court, makes adjudication, right, a ruling. But yet the colonists put in the treaty during this time that they could now appeal it back to what? Another court in the sod. But where's the sod? In France. Switzerland. Oh, in the, in the Switzerland? Yeah. Switzerland. Switzerland is a neutral state, right? Neutrality state. So Switzerland ended up being one of the first world courts at that time of 1906. It was like the first world court in dealing with any disputes in the empire of Morocco. So they sent those disputes over to Switzerland, right? So the Switzerland bank will make the final decision because the Switzerland, not bank, but Switzerland courts acted like a world court, right? That must be understood at that time, 
Switzerland was the neutrality state. Just like right now, the Netherlands, right? The ICJ, the International Court of Justice, is located in the head of the Netherlands. And the Netherlands acts as a what? A neutral state. Switzerland was the neutral state back in the day. So therefore, council court, even right now, the Moors can make a ruling through your council court. No worries, that's your regional ruling, right? But the United States of America could take that same case to where? The ICJ. That's where the ICJ concept came from, this treaty right here. The International Court of Justice as a world court was established because of this concept right here. That even though the Moors have council court, it can make a ruling. The college can always appeal it outside of the jurisdiction to go to a neutral jurisdiction, a neutral now court. That way the final decision would be held in the ICJ. And that's the reason when the ICJ would tell you in their statutes and their handbook that all their rulings are final. There's no appeal. That must be understood. All right? All their concepts came from this treaty. Okay, Article 46. Article 46. In case of dispute over the clauses of the concession or litigation arising between the Moorish government and the bank, the difference shall be referred without appeal or recourse to the Federal Court of Lucerne. All disputes arising between the shareholders and the bank in regard to the enforcement of the bylaws or by reason of the corporate business shall likewise be referred without appeal or recourse to the same court. Okay. So right there and there, we're still talking about the fact that council court does have jurisdiction over these cases dealing with the bank. But the columns put a provision in there that said, yeah, that can't be the final ruling. Let's have a provision that says we can also take it to a neutral court that was located in Switzerland. Okay? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to get a nice clean read from Article 46 all the way to Article 50. Okay, man? All right. Article 47. The bylaws of the bank shall be framed on the following basis by a special committee provided for in Article 57. They shall be approved by the censors and ratified by the General Assembly of Shareholders. Article 48. The General Constitu Constituent Assembly of the Corporation shall fix the place where the meetings of the shareholders and the sessions of the Board of Directors shall be held. The latter, however, shall have the faculty of meeting at any other city if it deems it expedient. The office of the manager of the bank shall be at Tangier. Article 49. The bank shall be administered by a board of directors constituting of as many members as there are parts in the initial capital. The directors shall have the most extensive powers for the administration and management of the corporation. They shall especially appoint the managers, assistant managers, and members of the commission indicated in Article 54 as well as the managers of branches and agencies. The employees of the company shall be recruited so far as possible from among the citizens, subjects, or protégés of the several powers which have taken part in subscribing the capital. Article 50. The directors who shall be appointed by the General Assembly of Shareholders shall be nominated by the groups subscribing the capital. The first board shall remain five years in office. At the expiration of this period, there shall be a renewal at the rate of three members annually. The order of outgoing directors shall be determined by lot. There may be re they may be re-elected. On the constitution of the corporation, each subscribing group shall have the right to nominate as many directors as it shall have subscribed entire parts but such groups shall not be compelled to select candidates of their own nationality. The subscribing groups shall not retain their right of nominating directors when the latter are superseded or re-elected, unless they can prove they still have in their possession at least one half a share conferring that right upon them. In a case where by reason of these provisions, a subscribing group shall be no longer in a position to nominate a director, the General Assembly of Shareholders shall make a direct nomination. All right, thank you very much. Now, what we learn in Articles 46 through 50, in which we won't need to go through that complete um, series of provisions because those provisions are basically just setting up the, the, the board of directors. 
right? That's all it is, setting up governance of an international organization or an intergovernmental organization known as the bank. But always remember that banks are charters, okay? And all of those banks are tied back to a jurisdiction. And the jurisdiction is always Morocco. All right? That must be understood. Okay, for example. The International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Why am I talking about this? I'm just using it as an example. Right? Because we can also talk about what they call the Federal Reserve, because the Federal Reserve is also an intergovernmental organization, is a privatized bank. That shareholders and privateers own that charter, they own that corporate constitution. All right, so let's go back to charter before we go into IMF. Go back to charter. So charter, right? Charter. The charter is a contract between the state and the corporation, between the corporation and the stockholders, and between the stockholders and the state. See, the state sets up the charter, and the charters are typically privatized organizations. Okay? Okay, let's go back to IMF. Where's the IMF? A corporation. A charter. Right? It's an intergovernmental organization. But the IMF is an intergovernmental organization of who? The United States. The United States has now made the IMF a member of the United Nations. More or less like their trust where they utilize the monies through the IMF to loan monies out to other states. Okay? Let's get into it. What's the, what's the International Monetary Fund? Fund, IMF. Mother? The International Monetary Fund. Okay. The International Monetary Fund is an international intergovernmental organization. Example, an international financial institution headquartered in Washington, D.C., consisting of 190 countries. Formed in 1944, started on December 27, 1945, at the Britain Woods New Hampshire Conference, primarily by the ideas of Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes. It came into formal existence in 1945 with 29 member countries and the goal of reconstructing the international monetary system. Okay, so why am I highlighting this? Because everybody had to buy into it. Yes, everybody had to buy into it, right? But where was the International Monetary Fund established? In Morocco. Yeah. Which gives our Empire State Bank jurisdiction even over the IMF. So therefore, the IMF, they tell you by their own record, they'll say, it's headquartered in Washington, D.C. Well, where's Washington, D.C.? In Morocco. So it originally started in Britain Woods, New Hampshire. Well, where's the Charter Colony known as New Hampshire? In Morocco. So they had a conference, right? So this, these gentlemen, Harry Dexter White, who's a citizen of the United States, and John Maynard Keynes, which was a citizen of Great Britain, they came up with the concept of, of this banking system, right? It came into formal existence in 1945. What else happened in 1945? The establishment of the United Nations Charter, right? So as you can see, these two are working hand in hand. All this is taking place where? In Morocco, in the Empire of Morocco, more specifically in the West, as the world calls the West. So all this is taking place right here in our front yard of the Empire, right? So the IMF, as they call it, the acronym, is a charter. And our Empire State Bank will have jurisdiction even over the IMF. Now, I don't say that for more to be aggressive towards the IMF. I'm trying to give you an example that when Noah Dralee says we're rich, we're actually wealthy because we oversee these banks. What does that mean when we oversee the banks? They owe us taxes, consumption taxes. They owe us interest. You can't establish nothing in somebody's land without paying rent. You must understand. All this time, the reason why they had to give you the nominee gear of Negro, Black, Colored, African American, Slave, etc., is because they did not want you to understand the party name to the contract. 
And what's the party name to the contract? More. What's the party name to the contract? Morris. What's the most specific party name you need to know about? Empire State. The word state and constitutions is what sets up your opportunity to enforce your cost of jurisdiction over any banks. That must be understood. Treaty supreme law of the land, not charters. So you must understand more as, as it relates to what they call sequential order. An organic state has, can, has, supersedes any international organization. States are sovereign, not international organizations, not corporations. Corporations and intergovernmental organizations, international organizations are all subordinate to states. There are no international organizations, and there are, not, there are no more international organizations or intergovernmental organizations, I, sh I should say, unless what? There's a state that sets it up and extends a permit, a permit to that financial, financial institution. That must be understood. Without the state, there's no charters. So who oversees everything that goes on the empire? Competent, more states. And more specifically, the empire state that once concluded through a constitution called the United States of Morocco will oversee all banks in the empire. This is important to understand. Okay, let's go back to the treaty. Why don't I go back to Article 49? Okay, look what the colonists are talking about once again. They're talking about who? Choosing employees. Mm -hmm. Right? They're choosing citizens, subjects, and protégés to work at these banking institutions. Morris have to understand the word subject and protégé is in your treaties. That's exactly your political status if you don't return to Morocco. And citizens, Subjects and protégés cannot enforce the jurisdiction in Morocco because you're still what? Subjugated. You, don't, you haven't corrected your political status. That's why they're pointing this out in Article 49. Where are they going to get their employees from? The people who live in the land. Just like they said about the slaves out there picking cotton, where did they get them from? The people who live in the land. Who do they get to work for their corporations? The people that live in the land. That's why the colonists have outsourced all of the so-called jobs overseas. They gave the jobs to everybody in different lands. So therefore, they're picking what? Citizens, subjects, and protégés over in different states. They choose them from the people of the land. That must be understood in Article 49. They're talking about these subjects and protégés. Just wanted to point that out. Okay. Let's move on to this right here. On the constitution of the corporation, right? You see how they phrase that in Article 49? Corporations can have constitutions because a constitution just sets up the bylaws. But when a state, an organic state, sets up a constitution, it has every right to make a land claim because it's organic. What does organic mean? It's claiming the actual soil. Everything in the soil, everything on top of the soil, all the air rights and the sea rights. Corporations cannot claim estates. They can only lease parcels of land in that estate or state because the state is sovereign. So therefore, can constitutions be considered corporations and corporations can have constitutions? Yes. Because you have to understand the meaning of the constitution. It depends on how it's set up. Who has the constitution? Is it the organic state or is it the charter? That's where you have to make the distinction. This is why the United States of America had to undermine the Moors because their United States of America constitution was a charter and charters are subordinate <clears throat> to the sovereign. They didn't want to pay taxes to the Moors. That must be understood. Okay, so let's start our reading of Article 51. 
through 55, and hopefully we'll get through 58 as well. Okay, Mother? Let's get started. Article 51. Each of the following institutions, the Bank of the German Empire, the Bank of England, the Bank of Spain, and the Bank of France, shall, with their government's approval, appoint a censor for the State Bank of Morocco. The censor shall remain in office four years. The outgoing censors may be reappointed. In the case of death or resignation, the institution which had appointed the former incumbent shall fill the vacancy, but only for the unexpired term of the vacated office. Article 52. The censors who shall exercise their mandate by virtue of this act of the signatory powers shall, in the interests of the latter, see that the bank is efficiently operated and ensure the strict observance of the clauses of the concession and of the statutes. They shall see that the regulations governing the issuance of notes are pre precisely fulfilled and shall be supervised, and, and shall supervise the operations tending to put the monetary situation on a sound basis, but they shall never, under any pretext, interfere in the conduct of business or in the internal administration of the bank. Each of the censors shall be empowered to examine at all times the bank accounts and to call for information either from the board of directors or the manager's office with regard to the management of the bank and attend the meetings of the board of directors, but only in an advisory capacity. The four censors shall meet at Tangier in the discharge of their duties at least once every two years at a time to be fixed by, the, by them. Other meetings at Tangier or elsewhere may take place if three of the censors shall demand it. The four censors shall draw up in common accord an annual report which shall be annexed to that of the board of directors. The board of directors shall transmit without delay a copy of such report to each of the government signatory to the act of the conference. Article 53, the censors, emoluments, and traveling expenses shall be fixed by the committee on bylaws. They shall be paid directly by the banks charged with their nomination and the amount of reimbursed, and the amount reimbursed to these institutions by the State Bank of Morocco. Article 54, to assist the manager's office, a committee shall be established at Tangier, the members of which shall be chosen by the board of directors without distinction of nationality from among the notables residing at Tangier and holding shares of the bank. This committee, which shall be presided over by one of the managers or assistant managers, shall give its advice on questions of discounts and opening of credit accounts. It shall transmit a monthly report on these various subjects to the board of directors. Article 55, the capital of which the amount shall be fixed by the special committee designated in Article 57 shall be not less than 15 million francs nor more than 20 million francs and shall be gold coin and the shares thereof of the value of 500 francs each shall be dis inscribed with the various gold, gold coinages at a fixed rate of exchange as determined by the bylaws. The said capital may thereafter be increased at one or more times by a decision of the General Assembly of Shareholders. The subscription to the increased capital shall be reserved for all shareholders without distinction of groups in proportion to their individual holdings. All right, thank you very much, Mother. All right, so what should we take away from this? Obviously, they're just still setting up the board, they're understanding the bylaws, who's in charge. But that's the question at the end of the day. Who is in charge of the banking? Okay, you notice they keep using this word censor, right? Mm -hmm. So the censors, who's the censors? What did we learn about that in chapter three? The censor is who? The Moore state government, who they, the high commissioner, and the censors are the Moors, overseeing these board of directors, right? Don't get me wrong, the board of directors are working side by side with the Moorish government and the state. But the censor has the jurisdiction over the bank and over the shareholders. And if the Moorish council court has the jurisdiction over any disputes as it relates to that bank. That must be understood. The censor is a very important word that you're learning here, okay? Let's move on.
Okay, well, let's go ahead and pick up Article 56. Article 56, the initial capital of the bank shall be divided to, into as many equal parts as there are participants among the powers represented at the conference. To this end, each power shall designate a bank which shall exercise either for itself or for a group of banks the above specified right of subscription as well as the right of nomination of the directors as provided in Article 50. Any bank selected as head of a group may, with its government's authorization, be superseded by another bank of the same country. States wishing to avail themselves of their rights of subscription must notify such intention to the royal government of Spain within a period of four weeks from the signature of this act by the representatives of the powers. Two parts, however, equal to those reserved to each of the subscribing groups shall be assigned to the consortium of banks signatory of the contract of June 12, 1904, in compensation for the secession which shall be made by the consortium to the State Bank of Morocco. One, of the rights specified in Article 33 of the contract, two, of the right inscribed in Article 32, Paragraph 2, of the contract concerning the available balance of the customs receipts with the express reservation of the general preferential right to the aggregate proceeds of customs granted to bondholders by Article 11 of the same contract. Article 57, within a period of three weeks from the time of closing, the subscriptions notified by the Royal Government of Spain to the powers interested, a special committee imposed by delegates appointed by the subscribing groups as provided in Article 50 for the appointment of directors shall meet with a view to elaborating the bylaws of the bank. The General Constituent Assembly shall meet two months after the ratification of this act. The functions of such special committee shall cease upon the organization of the corporation. The special committee shall fix the place of its meetings. Article 58, no modification shall be made in the bylaws except on the motion of the Board of Directors and with the advice and consent of the censors and the Imperial High Commissioner. Such modifications must be voted by a three-quarters majority, either present or represented, of the Assem General Assembly of Shareholders. All right, and that is the end of the reading of Chapter 3. As I wrap up with this last article of Article 58, what's the most important thing we take as we close out Chapter 3? I'll read it back to you. No modification shall be made in the bylaws except the motion of the Board of Directors and with the advice and consent of the censors and the Imperial High Commissioner. That's what you must understand about this banking. Moors oversee all banking. That must be understood. All right, so we'll go ahead and get into, in class 61, we'll start in chapter 4, which is about the Kadi. Right? How do we collect on taxes and revenue? All right? So we'll go ahead and end with that. All right? Islam.